I'd like to welcome you to UWMC Theatre and tonight's event. I'd like to start by uh, reminding you of next week's event, uh, next Wednesday, the 8th of May, at 7 o'clock in the theatre here. Um, will be the last event in our year-long Shared Reading, Shared Thoughts, Campus and Community Affluenza program, and our speaker will be John Foley of UW-Madison, Director of the Center for Sustainability and the Global Environment. Um, for this entire affluenza program, uh, we want to thank the Wisconsin Humanities Council and all the other generous sponsors who've made this possible. I would remind you also that there are response sheets if you have uh, some reaction uh, that you'd share with us. We value that for future programming. And there will be a reception after Bill McKibben's presentation in the Terrace Room, which is just out the doors and to your right. In introducing uh, Bill McKibben, I tell you that this is the capstone event of our program. And I'm pleased to have made it through that part of the introduction because I was afraid I was going to say headstone for uh, <laughs> but, but no. Um, Bill McKibben uh, wrote a book called The End of Nature, which was published in 1989. Um, and the title, The End of Nature, is, is a little daunting, a little depressing on the face of it. In the book, he explains that he is not predicting the end of the natural world uh, in all senses, but rather the end of nature as we have known it and depend upon, depended upon it for countless generations. Things like growing cycles and uh, climatic rhythms and so on. But it sounds pretty depressing uh, at, at first look. And Bill McKibben has impressed me over the years with the, the sharp, uncompromising eye which he has for what we're up against. Uh, and he pulls no punches with regard to the dangers, uh, the compromises, the catastrophic consequences that can come from our continuing along the environmental road that we are now walking. But at the same time, um, he knows as well as anybody and teaches that uh, despair does nobody any good. Despair does not motivate people. It does not result in solutions. And I think it's interesting that that shows in the titles of some of the books that he's written since the end of nature and the subtitles. For example, Enough, Staying Human in an Engineered Age. Uh, staying Human suggests that uh, it's under threat, but it is not gone yet. Hundred Dollar Holiday, The Case for a More Joyful Christmas. There is that word joyful in there, suggesting that all is not entirely lost. Hope, Human and Wild, True stories of living lightly on the earth. The idea that hope is possible and living lightly is possible. And then the title of his newest book, Deep Economy, The Wealth of Communities and the Durable Future. The Wealth of Communities and the Durable Future. If we get it right, the future is durable. And finally, his title for the talk tonight, Deep Economy, What Would It Mean If We Took Happiness Seriously? Which kind of suggests that Happiness is in there is still a possibility if we readjust. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Bill McKibben. Thank you much for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to meet the person behind the poems, JD. And it's a real pleasure to be here today. I'm, I'm echoing in my own ears. Am I echoing in your ears? Um, I'm sure Chris will keep us from echoing now. I can see him nodding. Um, it's, a real it's a real pleasure to be here, first of all, on such a gorgeous uh, Wisconsin day. Um, and in fact, we went out to dinner tonight, and we had, for me anyway, the first actual taste of spring, um, some arugula from Tony and Kat's farm at the uh, restaurant that we were at, and it tasted awfully good. And, uh, Reminded me that we pretty much made it through the winter and uh, um, on into on into the other seasons. Um, it's really fun to be here as the part of this forum on affluenza. Uh, I've known John DeGraff, who wrote first did that film and then wrote the book for many years, and admired his work a great deal. And in fact, he emailed me this afternoon to say that he's going to be in Vermont where I am next week and we are going to get together. So it'll be a pleasure to tell him uh, exactly how seriously his ideas and things have been taken here. That's the greatest pleasure always for authors. 
as I begin, I, you know, I'm actually going to begin not talking quite about the topic that I promised to talk about. Um, I'm going to start by telling you about how I've spent my winter, which seems a little removed from the question at hand, but in fact will, I think, circle back around to it. Now, as JD said, uh, I, I've been writing about global warming for a very long time. The End of Nature back in 19 and 89 was the first book on that topic. And mostly I've been writing and speaking about it and a certain amount of kind of organizing and activism, but really entered a new phase in that regard last summer when I was finally just in a condition of real despair about how little was going on. Hurricane Katrina had come through and so had Al Gore's movie and everybody was kind of educated about the problem, but still there was nothing happening. Nothing in Washington where there's been a 20 year bipartisan effort to really accomplish nothing and it's been highly successful. <laughs> um, and so I decided in my kind of clueless way that, that, that yeah, I needed to do something just to sort of live with myself. So I called up a couple of friends of mine in Vermont and I said, a couple of writer friends and things, let's walk up to Burlington, which is our main city, and we'll sit in on the steps of the federal building and you know, hold a sign or something, well maybe we'll get arrested and it'll, like, at least there'll be a story in the newspaper, we will have done something. So you can tell this was not really the most thought out plan in, in history. <laughs> Um, and indeed, uh, you know, my friend says, okay, we'll go do it. But one of them was wise enough to call up to the police in Burlington and ask them what would happen were we to carry out this endeavor. And the police said, well, nothing will happen. Basically, you can sit there on the steps of the federal building till the end of time for all we care. <laughs> um, um, the implication was that we would need to burn down the federal building. Um, <laughs> and the carbon emissions from that would have been <laughs> prohibitive. So instead, we sort of converted this thing into this just kind of mass walk. And we started, we left from Robert Frost's old summer riding cabin uh, up, in the, up in the Green Mountains, because we really liked, you know, we loved Frost there. And we were thinking about that poem, the sort of most famous poem of his about the road not taken. And, that's the road we set out on a little bit, and five days later we got to Burlington. And you know, by, by that time we sort of camped in fields along the way and did programs in churches at night and things. And by the time we got to Burlington, there were a thousand of us marching, which in Vermont is actually a lot of people. <laughs> um, this was the largest gathering for any political purpose in a very long time in Vermont, and it was enough so that all of our candidates for federal office came down for our final rally, all the people who are running for Senate and Congress. And we were asking them to endorse, to sign on, literally sign on to this big board we had with the kind of pledge that they would work to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050 uh, in Congress, which would be which a pretty ambitious and dramatic plan, and certainly at that time the most ambitious one that people had sort of proposed. But what do you know? All of them stood up there in front of us and signed it, and said the right things, even the quite conservative candidates. The woman who was running on the GOP ticket for Congress and who almost won had said in her announcement two months before for office that she wasn't sure that global warming was real and that more research needed to be done. <coughs> well, and this was important for me to realize, it turned out that the research that needed to be done was how many people would walk across the state of Vermont to <laughs> ask for change. And that was a good lesson for me. And, and uh, you know, uh, that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, the depressing thing was to pick up the newspaper the next day and read a story saying that this may have been the largest crowd that had yet assembled in this country to protest climate change, global warming. Um, and when I read that, some of the scales fell from my eyes and I understood why one of the reasons we were making so little progress, you know, that that we had all the scientific understanding we'd ever need of this problem. We had the economists and the policy people who had done good work about how to solve it and the engineers who were coming up with new technologies and on and on and on. We had all the things that you would need for a movement except the movement part, you know, except people actually doing things. So we decided to see if we could replicate this, uh, this winter, this Vermont thing nationally. And on January 10th, working with six 
college kids, six kids who had just graduated from Middlebury College in Vermont, where I teach, we started a website called stepitup07.org. And we asked people to organize rallies in their communities on April 14th. And we had no real expectations when we started, because we had no organization and we had no money. Um, our sort of secret hope that we didn't tell anyone for fear of sounding grandiose was that we'd managed to organize about 100 of these rallies around the country, which would have been about 100 more than there'd been to date. But instead, and not really because of our great organizing skill, um, because there were a lot of people, it turned out, who wanted to do something about this, who'd been kind of haunted a little bit by it and not sure what to do and how to take action. Because of that, the thing took off. Um, there were 1,400 demonstrations on April 14th in every state in the Union and almost every congressional district in the country. It was a very hopeful and powerful day for me. Um, and I'm going to stop talking about it right now because I want to, but the part of it I want to, I'm going to come back to it, but the part of it I want to leave you with that turns out to be important in the context of the rest of this talk is that there were 1,400 of these demonstrations scattered all over the country, taking place in all kinds of small local places. It wasn't a march on Washington, okay? It was sort of the opposite. So just keep that thought in your heads, because I'm going to try to make it tie back in with the other things that I want to talk about tonight. Because that sort of work, for me, is the short-term solution to the predicament that we find ourselves in. And the longer term solution um, is the stuff that I'm writing about in this new book, Deep Economy, which frankly is a somewhat subversive book. Um, it attempts to take on the fundamental unasked default assumption of our society, um, the idea that the point of our society and our economy is to grow larger and that more is better. If you have any doubt that that's the default assumption of our society, just turn on the news tonight when you get home. And, you know, the good, unbiased, objective newscaster, nonetheless, when they get to the economic news, will say something like, good news on the economic front today. Uh, 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 the gross national product rose 3%. And they'll never say, troubling news on the economic front today. Housing starts were up 12% or something. Even though if people really stop to think about it, most people can come up with some, at least a few reasons why it might be at least mixed blessing to imagine another wave of subdivisions on the edge of town or, or whatever it is. This is so deep in us that it's very hard for us to understand, I think, how what, what a given it is. Even the kind of language that we use to talk about I don't know, does your public radio station here carry marketplace in the evening? Yeah. You ever notice that the whole thing is like, if the stock market goes up, they play happy music. And if the, <laughs> the sort of sad dirge, if the stock market has gone down. Um, I mean, even the language that we use, like, uh, 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 you know, the economy is, is ailing. It suffered a setback. I mean, they're so, they're so we cherry, you know, and then the economy is in recovery, or it's Flourishing. I mean, the sort of tenderness that we lavish on this abstract thing is really quite um, amazing to think about. And so much more than we, you know, concern than we pay for, say, the physical world, of which, after all, the economy is really a subset. I mean, you can check the temperature of the economy every hour on the hour. Just flip on the radio and someone's telling you what the Dow Jones average is. And we take the temperature of the planet somewhat less often than that. And it may turn out that that was a poor ordering of priorities in the long run. Now, the reason that this became our sort of default assumption, I think, is pretty clear and pretty good, which is that for a long time, most Americans lived in conditions of pretty much material deprivation. And hence, it's easy to understand why people would want more stuff, more ease, more convenience, more comfort. I read a lot of books with my daughter, and we've read, the, of course, several times through the Laura Ingalls Wilder, Laura Ingalls Wilder books, which I'm sure many of you have read, Little House on the Prairie, you know, say. Uh, with those sort of wonderful descriptions of frontier life, some of them not that far from here, um, 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 you know, of a life that's 
very rich in family and in community, but extremely poor materially. I mean, Christmas comes, and maybe you get a penny or a stick of candy or maybe a little rag doll or something. I, I was thinking of that some when I was in China in the last couple of years doing some reporting for the National Geographic. And it was extremely interesting um, because that's still a very poor place for the most part where people are trying hard to get out of almost impossible rural poverty. The average holding in much of China is a sixth of an acre. The soil is pretty played out. I mean, it's poor in a way that you can hardly imagine until you get there. Um, and so when you go to, say, factories, um, it's clear that for many people this represents an improvement over their other possibilities. I remember spending a couple of days at a shower curtain factory <coughs> north of Beijing. Uh, and there were a few hundred people there, all between the ages of 18 and 22. Uh, so it was sort of like college, except instead of studying things, people were making shower curtains. It wasn't Dickensian. It was, it was OK. It was actually pretty good as Chinese factories go. And most of the people there perceived it as an improvement, I think. I remember wandering through the dorms where the kids uh, uh, lived. In the girls' dorms, there were four, there were two bunk beds. There were four girls per room. And most of them had stuffed animals on their beds. So that afternoon when I was interviewing one young woman, uh, just to sort of make small talk and things, I, I asked her if she had a stuffed animal. And instantly I knew I'd asked the wrong question because her eyes just started to fill up with tears. Um, she was, since she was 19, she said she really liked stuffed animals, but she never had one. Um, every penny she made went straight back home because, you know, her trying to get her brother through school and her, you know, parents were sick and needed what help she could give and so on and so forth. Well, needless to say, by the end of the day, she had the largest stuffed animal in that corner of China. <laughs> she was happy to get it. All the other kids, more to the point there, were really happy to see her get it. It was quite moving to sort of see their pleasure in her pleasure. Um, but it really made me think for a while about these stunning differences between uh, 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 different kinds of human lives. I mean, my daughter likes stuffed animals, too. but the Biodiversity of beanie babies in her bedroom, you know, mimics that of the Peruvian Amazon. Um, <laughs> uh, and really, the next one counts almost not at all. I mean, what the economist would say that the marginal utility of the next stuffed animal is extremely low. Um, um, we don't live in Little House on the Prairie anymore. We tend to live in Big House on the cul-de-sac, you know? Um, and because of that, it's time to start thinking a little more clearly about whether or not we need exactly the same set of aspirations that people had in a different time and in a different place. Because there are big problems with that endless idea of endless growth going on forever and ever. I'm only going to talk briefly about the first and most obvious of them, the ecological one, into which we're now, the sort of cliff off which we're now quickly driving. Um, um, I'm not going to belabor it, um, uh, although, trust me, I could. Um, <laughs> global warming is the most profound example of this. When I wrote The End of Nature back in 1989, global warming, as I was saying earlier this afternoon, was still a hypothesis. I thought it was a strong one. But, you know, there was still some room to doubt. Science went to work hard on that problem. They removed the reasons to doubt by 1995 or so, when the first assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made it very clear that humans were heating the planet and that it was going to be a serious problem. Since that time, the planet itself has peer-reviewed that science relentlessly to make sure it's correct. We've had the 10 warmest years on record. In fact, the, change, the changes are coming faster than we would have guessed 20 years ago. Um, they're coming extremely fast, partly because a whole series of positive feedback loops are now kicking in to amplify the warming that we've, that we've kicked off by burning so much coal and gas and oil. 
And you can, I mean, if you read science or nature, you know, weekly, you get a kind of weekly update on what these feedback loops are, and they're each one sort of scarier than the next. Sea ice in the Arctic melting very fast. In fact, there was a paper in Geophysical Letters today uh, saying that the rate of sea ice melt has been underestimated. It's going much faster than we thought, and there's possibility of an ice-free summer Arctic by 2020 or 2025, which is 25 years earlier than we would have said even a couple of years ago. Um, um, that is a you know, one proof of the fact that we're warming the planet. But worse than that, it becomes itself a contributing factor. You take that nice white ice that reflects about 80% of the sun's rays back out to space, and you melt it, and you're left with nice blue water that absorbs about 80% of the sun's rays. And changes like that in the planet's albedo are uh, one of the ways in which we're now seem to be accelerating this, this warming. There are plenty of others having to do with things like methane, um, uh, methane that's been long stored beneath the tundra and the permafrost of the north, but it's beginning to be released in large quantities, uh, including the you know sort of longer growing seasons, which at our latitude mean that soils and forest soils in particular uh, are now giving off more carbon with each passing year as microbial decay continues longer into the fall and starts earlier in the spring. They're no longer reliable sinks for carbon, but are becoming sources. All these sort of things uh, lead us to think now, in the words of James Hansen of NASA, our leading climatologist, that the time, whatever window we have, is shorter than we would have said even a little while ago. He said last year, in a speech to the American Geophysical Union, that we had 10 years as a world to start putting less carbon into the atmosphere instead of more, or else we would cross some of these thresholds um, that, in his words, would create a totally different planet. And the thresholds that he was looking most closely at were the ones about what we're starting to understand about dynamic reactions on the ice sheets above Greenland and the West Antarctic. 20 years ago, we had a sort of simplified understanding on all this, and we thought it would take an extremely long time to melt those ice sheets. As you would sort of expect, because they're like a mile and a half thick, right? That's a lot of inertia. It's hard to even figure out how you'd go about sort of melting it. And the theory was that temperatures would rise a little, and you'd get a little melt on the top, and the water that melted would evaporate politely out into the atmosphere. And this would take a long time. But that's not what's happening. These systems turn out to be much more fissured and fractured than people had understood. And that water, as it melts, is cascading down to the bottom of these ice sheets, and where it begins to grease the skids for their slide <coughs> into the ocean. And that lurching is now underway. And it's pretty unsettling, the data that's coming back. So Hansen's prediction, and it's as good as we have as anything to go on, is that we have 10 years. It's very difficult to imagine beginning to turn around the, you know, in any time frame like that, our use of fossil fuels, and still continuing to grow our economies uh, at the rates at which they're growing now. Because that growth has historically always been tied to the availability of cheap fossil fuel. And there's nothing on the horizon to substitute for that that would all, and you can tell that that's the case because what's the excuse that the Bush administration, for instance, always gives for doing nothing about climate change? It's always, and this was repeated as recently as yesterday by the relevant officials, it's always that doing anything about it would slow down economic growth. So we can't be about doing anything. Yet. So that's the ecological problem, and as I say, we could embroider this for a very long time, and I could tell you all the reasons to be deeply concerned about it, um, um, but I'm not going to do that. Um, um, I'm happy to we can ask questions about it and things later, but it's less interesting in a sense, although more important, than this other problem I want to discuss about economic growth and expansion. This is another one that we're just coming to sort of really understand or at least have proof of. Um, but it's the notion that growth and expansion is no longer making us particularly happy. If you've been reading Affluenza, you have in other sort of books like it, you have some understanding of you know, this idea anyway. Um, but it's important to understand how this science kind of evolved. For a long time, academics 
pretty much disdained the idea that you could, you know, that this would be an interesting question. Are you happy? Is your life good? Is it, I mean, they're sort of seen as sort of too broad, soft, squishy a question to answer. And anyway, economists kept assuring people that their concept of utility was good enough to cover it. You know, that the, the idea that you can tell what makes someone happy by what they buy, in essence, okay? Even though everybody understands that at some level that's a dubious proposition, it served as a reasonable proxy, I guess. About 10 years ago, some economists and sociologists and other social scientists began trying to dig a little more deeply into this question. The first thing they needed to figure out was whether it really made sense to ask people, are you satisfied with your life? Would the answer that you give be, mean anything? Okay. Being economists, they began by studying this in sort of grim and dismal ways. Um, Daniel Kahneman, uh, who later won the Nobel for economics, his first paper that described in this book, Hedonics, that he wrote a, a number of years ago, the first study he described was one where they interrupted people every 10 seconds as they had colonoscopies to ask them sort of how they were feeling. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, this kind of work went on for a long time, five or six years, a lot of work, a lot of papers. Um, and at the end, the general conclusion, I think, of the various professions was that, in fact, subjective well-being was a robust phenomenon. That if you told me whether you were happy or not, it correlated pretty well with how other people saw you. It correlated with certain brain chemistry measurements that we could do on and on and on. That it made sense to ask. And so once we knew that, then you could start sort of looking at what data there was. And that data was kind of interesting and disturbing. For instance, every year since the end of World War II, one of the big national polling firms has asked Americans, are you happy? The number of Americans who answer that they're very happy peaks in 1956 and goes slowly but steadily downhill since then. Now, when I read that, two things struck me. One was that I was born in 1960 and hence missed whatever fun was <laughs> going on in 1956. Uh, but the other deeper thing that struck me was how odd that downward curve was, okay? Because in that same 50-year period, our average material standard of living, the amount of stuff that we have, has about trebled. Okay? We have endlessly bigger homes, we have way more cars, way more appliances, we take far more vacations, we eat a much wider variety of food, on and on and on. If the things that we tell ourselves are true, were, were uh, you know, true about the economy, those two curves should bear some relationship to each other, okay? They shouldn't just split apart like that in that fundamental way. And you know, that sort of pulling evidence isn't the only, I mean, there's endless amounts of evidence you can point to to show that Americans are in fact much less happy than they were a generation or two ago. Rates of depression have skyrocketed on and on and on. The question then becomes why? And there's not, unbelievable quantities of evidence yet, but what there is all tends to point in the same direction. And it points in the direction of concluding that these, that divergence between prosperity and happiness is not merely coincidental, that there may be things about that affluence that are causing some of that dissatisfaction. Think about what we started to spend money on in the 1950s. Mostly, for the last 50 years, the biggest bulk of our expenditure has gone to building bigger houses further out in the suburbs. That's been the single largest by far economic driver in America, in post-war America. Okay. Well, what's the effect of that? The effect of that is to kind of mathematically reduce the chances that you're going to run into other people in the course of a day. All right? Um, um, and it's been very successful. The number of close friends that an American has is about half what it was 50 years ago. The amount of time that people spend eating with friends, family, neighbors is well less than half that it was 50 years ago. Okay. 
it turns out that those things matter. That they matter more than the fact that we have twice as many square feet, or twice as big a car, or whatever else. It just turns out, as it were, that you know, having conducted this experiment, we can now say with increasing confidence that in fact every like spiritual leader as far back as the Buddha was sort of correct, you know, that you know, the sort of whole money happiness thing isn't anywhere near as obvious as people have, uh, you know, as people have assumed. But this cycle, I mean, really what's happened, I think, is that our affluence past a certain point has bred a kind of individualism that the world has never seen. Not just the kind of rugged individualism that sort of Americans like to pride themselves on, but a kind of over-the-top hyper-individualism um, that's incredibly counterproductive, but very hard to break out of. One of, the, one of the most telling stories I've seen in the newspaper in a long time was in the New York Times about three weeks ago. And it, uh, it, it was about sort of trends in upscale architecture. And I, I don't know if you have sort of people building huge homes around this part of the world at the moment, the sort of things that look like they're sort of built for entry-level monarchs, you know. Um, 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 I always kind of wonder what, what exactly is going on, why they're so big, and what's happening. Well, it turns out that one of the big trends at the moment, apparently a lot of this happening, is building homes with dual master bedrooms, okay? Because husbands and wives, you know, one snores or the other pulls the blankets off or something like that. And so the sort of American solution to this is to add 900 square feet to the house, you know, and put in another master bedroom. Now, you know, this is sort of tragedy and farce combining in a sense. I mean, I'm, you know, for one thing, those of you who've spent much time in the developing world know that in most of this planet, if you're lucky enough to have a bed at all, there's going to be four or five people in it, and no one's going to be worrying about who's snoring or, you know, whatever. But also, there's just something so sad about this kind of picture of, I mean, I mean, it's hard to sort of conjure up a vision of more sort of pure loneliness than that, you know, having to isolate yourself even from your spouse, you know, uh, on your own at, at all times. It's even, in a sense, is so pervasive in our society that even our religious life, you know, increasingly, there was an evangelical pollster, a guy named George Barna, who did a poll a few years ago. And this was one of these polls designed to test <coughs> what people knew about things. In this case, their biblical literacy. And of course, it's always a kind of poor idea to ask people what they know, because the answers are always a little discouraging. You know, <laughs> Of the 85% of, of Americans who consider ourselves Christian, only like 40% could remember the names of the Gospels and things like that. 12% of Americans firmly believe that Joan of Arc is Noah's wife, OK? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, I'm worried that might be the one thing you'll remember. <laughs> uh, uh, but the one statistic that really mattered in this poll, the one statistic that really mattered was this. 75% of American Christians thought that the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, comes from the Bible, instead of being, you know, Ben Franklin sort of channeling Aesop, you know. Um, 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 I mean, it's a very pithy expression of the kind of perfect American entrepreneurial individualist vigor, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And the problem is not that it's not in the Bible, the problem is it's the exact opposite of what's in the Bible. I mean, what does Jesus say endlessly? You know, all the sort of dim disciples keep saying, what's this about again? Just love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, over and over and over again, this sort of radical, subversive, statement about community, about what we're built to do, who we are. And that we've, you know, it's sort of telling how far from that we've managed to fall. The good news, I think, is that the solution to both these problems, or at least one solution, one partial solution to them, lies, I think, in the same direction, to both the ecological and the sort of human social one. And I think it lies 
in beginning to figure out how to build much stronger local economies that will bring us back in <coughs> touch with each other in very practical, physical ways, and that will also use resources way more efficiently than we do at the moment. I think it's not a good idea to kind of preach about community a lot. Communities become a sort of buzzword and everyone goes on and on about it, but it doesn't really mean very much absent some way to make it real. So how do you make it real? Well, you know, there's some very cool things that are starting to happen. Let's talk about food for a minute. The fastest growing part of the food economy in this country is farmers markets. They're growing 10 or 12 percent a year in sales volume. That's very good news, okay? It's very good news because, well, in physical terms, local food makes a lot more sense than doing what our sort of agribusiness, industrialized agriculture has, has taught us to do, which is essentially to order out dinner from 2,000 miles away every night of the year. That's about how far the average bite of food is traveling. I mean, we just operate on the premise that it's like it's always summer someplace, so let's eat there tonight, you know? Um, um, <laughs> And the energy cost of that can be incredibly high. I mean, where I live back east, to, if you, we, we want to eat lettuce now before the arugula has quite come up, we have to go to the supermarket and, you know, uh, 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 one calorie of lettuce grown in California and shipped back out east takes about 36 calories of fossil energy. That's a pretty poor ratio, you know, if one was serious about things like, like uh, climate change. It's also parenthetically, and maybe not so parenthetically, it's also pretty depressing when you consider that all you get for it is this kind of limp piece of lettuce, you know? It's like shipping baggies of water back and forth across the continent. I mean, I've traveled 2,000 miles in the last week, and I know how I feel. That's how the strawberry feels, too, you know? But the more interesting part of the farmer's market is not just the the, you know, it's sort of physical consequences. The more interesting part is it's kind of social consequence. A couple of years ago, a pair of sociologists followed shoppers, first around the supermarket, then around the farmer's market, okay? You all been to the supermarket. You walk in, you fall into a light fluorescent trance. You <laughs> circle the stations of the cross at the supermarket. Um, Somehow you emerge with pretty much the same basket of groceries that you've had for many other weeks in a row. Uh, you perhaps have the interesting paper or plastic conversation at the <laughs> checkout, and that's that. Mm -hmm. When they followed people around the farmer's market, okay, they had 10 times more conversations in the course of the visit. Now these were sociologists who were you know, used to trying to figure out whether 0.18% whatever represents statistically significant data. They had 10 times more conversations, okay? It wasn't like a different way of getting calories. It was an entirely different social experience, completely different. Um, um, and reflects, I think, some of the hunger for that kind of connection that people really have now. Um, um, you know, the, the number of so people who go once to a farmer's market and then keep coming back over and over again is extremely high because people are hooked not only on the good food, but on the kind of uh, 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 good feeling that comes. And you can take almost any commodity that we think of, well, most commodities, and do the same kind of analysis. I mean, think about energy itself, right? Just the way that Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland and things we sort of have as our huge brokers for calories. Uh, you know, ExxonMobil and Peabody Coal and people serve kind of the same role as brokers of BTUs or electrons or whatever it is, right? Um, it doesn't need to be that way. Energy doesn't have to work the way that the television works with a few huge producers beaming this stuff to us and we just consuming it. It could work sort of the way a farmer's market does, with many more people bringing their things and everybody sort of putting in and taking out. It could work like the internet. I have solar panels on my roof in Vermont. When the sun comes out, I'm a utility. I shoot electrons down the wire, and my neighbors you know, run their stereo off the sunlight on, on my roof. Cloud passes over, I get to suck energy back down from the grid. In the long run, that's a lot better system 
a lot more durable system than the one that we have at the moment, which is not only ecologically ruinous because of its reliance on fossil fuel, but also, you know, you have to be pretty much an optimist to think that, that the, our sort of current system is going to continue to be a durable and useful one endlessly into the future. I mean, it depends on, you know, <laughs> convincing people in West Virginia and Kentucky to continue blowing the tops off their mountains to get at the coal. And it depends on somehow figuring out how to manipulate the politics of, of uh, Middle Eastern countries, a practice that it's becoming clearer and clearer we're not all that good at, and, you know, um, um, on and on and on. It would be a lot sweeter in a lot of ways to be a little more self-reliant in this regard. Not reliant on our own selves, sort of living off the grid in our own sort of solipsistic paradise, but in much more of a kind of community network. I mean, it's the difference between growing everything you eat yourself, which is kind of noble, but also, you know, kind of isolationist and, and sort of grim at some level, and going to the farmer's market, you know, that sort of community, or, or going to the CSA farm and taking your share and whatever. The, the sort of things that build community are the things that are really interesting. You can even make this argument, and I was trying to do this earlier this afternoon with some of the students in one of the classes I was in. Um, you can even do this argument with much more ephemeral and soft things, you know, cultural things. Say. The example we were using today was music. At the moment, we think of music in much the same way we do food or energy. It comes from some centralized place, you know. Instead of Exxon, you have Sony or Time Warner or something. And they prepare music for you and put it in a very hard to open plastic box and send it in your direction. Okay? Um, and they get very upset if you, if you think about any other way that you might actually want to get at that, like downloading it on your computer, right? And what do they say when they're trying to intimidate people into not downloading music illegally? What do they say besides, we'll put you in prison? They say, if you do this, it'll undermine the economic basis of the music industry. There'll be no more reward for people to make music, and hence there won't be any music made. Okay? That's a pretty big leap since, you know, anthropologists in the room correct me, but pretty much every human culture that's ever existed has made music, all right? Um, uh, it's been a kind of defining feature. They've just had different models for how you make it. I was telling people earlier today that in the state of Iowa, in the year 1900, there were 1,300 opera houses, 1,300 live music venues, okay? Nobody singing in them was getting Whitney Houston rich, okay? And nobody listening in them was hearing the best musician in the world, the way that we now can, more or less, um, you know, if we have get the right CD or whatever. On the other hand, to compensate for that, everybody who was hearing anything was hearing it in the context of their neighbors, of their, you know, community. And that adds... I think, a real dimension of richness to that experience. It doesn't surprise me, therefore, that the fastest growing parts of the music industry right now, in fact, almost the only growing parts, are live performance and sort of traveling bands and festivals, um, um, the sort of uh, uh, successors of minstrels or bards of some other time. Okay? Uh, and it's because people are at least as interested in that experience as they are in the sort of mere consumption of music. It's the kind of opposite of the slightly sad, you know, I have my white earbuds in my ears sort of cocoon that we more and more tend to form. I mean, that's, you know, sort of like the dual master bedrooms or whatever. It's like, I want to be by myself, don't, you know. Um, and so it's good to see that there's a lot of that breaking down, I think. If you wanted to, if all of this seems, uh, you know, sort of if, uh, if a little too soft, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I think we, if we have this emergency with something like global warming, we better solve it instead with a lot of technology and new things, or whatever. Well, there's something to be said for that, and it's important that we do some of that work. But you know, it's really not as um, sentimental and soft as you might think. Um, 
We were talking earlier today about the comparison between the United States and Europe. How many people in this room have been to Western Europe sometime in the last 10 or 20 years? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Western Europe, yes, is a nice place. People seem to lead decent, dignified lives there, all of that. They've made slightly different choices over the years on this spectrum that runs from community at one end to this sort of hyper-individualism at the other. They pay a lot more in taxes, and in as a result, they have a lot of things like health care and education and retirement and things. They also have attractive cities uh, that draw people in instead of flinging them out into the suburbs. They have things like good mass transit. Not only do they have good mass transit, they take it once they have it. Um, people go five minutes out of their way. You know, they say, I've, you know, they don't even think about it in these terms. They just, it's accepted that you sort of schedule some of what you're doing around when the bus or the train comes, and you know that that's not considered. Well, what's interesting about all those sort of sets of choices that they've made are, are these two facts. One, European happiness, satisfaction, life satisfaction indices haven't declined the way that Americans have. They've actually stayed much higher and quite consistent. Even though on average, the average Western European has between half and two thirds the disposable income that the average American does. They have less stuff. They live in smaller homes, they take fewer vacations, or at least fewer you know, kind of vacations we take. They have a lot more time off, so they tend to travel a lot. Um, they have less stuff. Not only are they happier, they also use, per capita, one half as much energy as Americans use. One half. One half is actually a large number. Um, it's a lot more than we're going to get from hydrogen and ethanol and you know, all the other sort of thrilling things that we're always sort of rattling on about as solutions to things. They set up their world a little differently. And as a result, among other things, one of the most important questions in the world right now is, will China and India veer more in the direction of Europe or more in the direction of America as they develop? If they go more towards the European model, it's still pretty darn hard to make the math come out very well. But it's a lot easier than if they're heading in our direction. So back for a moment as I finish, and I know I've rattled on a little bit, so I'll finish. Um, back to this question about, or this sort of story about these climate change rallies that we organized this year. Right? Um, when we were starting all this, people said, oh, the people who knew what they were doing today, you, need, you should have a march on Washington, that's how these things are done. And indeed, there have been some great, obviously, marches on Washington that have been pretty important and pretty memorable. But, first of all, we didn't have any sort of Martin Luther King to go give a talk, so, you know. Um, second of all, we knew we didn't, I mean, this was me and six kids, we had no money, we knew we couldn't organize a march on Washington. You have to like, be able to rent 2,000 porta-potties, you know, to even start. I don't even know how you do it, you know, where, sort of where you begin. I didn't have any desire to find out. <laughs> Third, we thought there was something a little bizarre about sending people crossing the continent, spewing carbon behind them in order to deal with global warming. Fourth, most importantly, we thought it was most appropriate for people to do these things in the places that mattered to them. Partly because it would show their Congress people that it was their constituents who really cared about this. But more because we wanted people to sort of be able, against the backdrop of their own lives, say, here are sort of the things and iconic places and images and things that, that we want you to, we want to sort of hold in our minds as we make this case. So a lot of these took place on state capital steps or, you know, at, at church steps or, in, and a lot of them took place in very beautiful places, and it was amazing to see the creativity that people responded with. Uh, creativity we could never have sort of from the center supplied to people, you know. Um, it was way more fun than a march on Washington with one podium and one person talking and whatever. Um, instead, we had like, well, like in, uh, I was talking about earlier, in Jacksonville, Florida, the hunters and anglers got together with the, through the National Wildlife Federation. And they got a yacht and they got a, a crane and they hoisted this thing 20 feet up in the air to show people where the ocean would be if Greenland 
slid into the into the ocean, you know. Um, um, and it really made, they had a big lot of people there and it made a big impression. It was on all the newscasts and things. In Manhattan, where I was that morning, thousands of people in blue shirts came flooding down into lower Manhattan and they made a kind of sea of people to show where the tide line would come as sea level began to rise. In the Rockies and in the Sierras, there were people, some of whom did these sort of four-day ascents to these remote glacial peaks that, where the glaciers are just disappearing. They just skied in formation down into these webcasts from the top of the ski. To sort of say, look, in 50 years, this isn't going to be here. Some of the most beautiful stuff, and by the way, you can see all these pictures, and they're really beautiful. If you go to that website, stepitup07.org, and one of the things you'll see is this video from these, uh, all these scuba divers off Key West who went and did an underwater demonstration on the coral reefs, these coral reefs that are going to be gone in half a century if the ocean temperature keeps rising. And the kind of creativity that was unleashed everywhere was, was really cool. And what was quite especially neat about it was the fact that we could have all this going on in all these local places, and then we could knit it all back together very quickly. In the course of the day, at each of these rallies, people took pictures. And then they uploaded them to this website that we had, right? So that night in Washington, we got all these bigwigs together, and we rented a hall, and we started showing them these pictures uh, 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 coming in from around the country so that they could see that their constituents were demanding big action, 80% cuts by 2050. You know, that was the one thing that was on every sign. Um, um, in the next couple of days, we... Uh, printed out pictures from, printed out copies of each of these pictures and delivered them to the congressmen and their staffs from each district. Here are the ones that took place where you are. You know, on and on and on like that. Um, it was extremely exciting. And it reminded me uh, that, in a sense, we live in a very lucky moment. And we no longer have to make quite the choice that people once did. You know, there have been periods, long periods in our history, when you had to, in some sense, choose between your tight local community, living there, being a part of it, and sort of participating in the larger world. And a lot of people felt like they had to leave the one in order to go to the other, right? you know? That they would be stifled or whatever, where they were. It's a little less true now. There's, because of technologies, especially like the net, there's kind of a window open onto the larger world all the time. And you can have a very tight, local economy and local existence, but not, we're, I mean, there's always a kind of window open with a breeze to blow in new ideas, and blow out old prejudices, and share the best ways of doing things, and help people uh, work on things that they have to work on jointly, and all of that. It's a very interesting moment. Um, one for which, as I've tried to say in many ways, we need new ways of thinking about the world. Ways that by the by, are neither, it seems to me, liberal nor conservative. It's very difficult to figure out whether a farmer's market is a liberal or a conservative idea. <laughs> it's actually certain ways appealing to both philosophies, and in certain ways there's parts of it that's repugnant to both philosophies, too. It's sort of different than that. It's on some other axis, you know. Um, uh, I'll end just by saying that my friend in Vermont, a fellow named Todd Murphy, uh, a friend of mine who started a diner, a place called the Farmer's Diner. And it only it serves diner food, you know, ham and eggs, hash browns, things, at diner prices. But all the food comes from within about 50 miles of the kitchen. He's worked really hard, and it was really hard. I mean, there was like nobody left in Vermont raising commercial pork, for instance, because, you know, now pork is something that you raise 700,000 head at a time. And, well, it's actually, there's, they, just opening a hog farm in Utah with two and a half million uh, uh, animals. More sewage produced in the course of a day than the city of Los Angeles okay, on this farm. But, but he, so he worked hard to kind of rebuild, start rebuilding some of this agricultural infrastructure. Well, when he opened up, he put out a bunch of bumper stickers. And the bumper stickers said, think globally, act neighborly which seems to me a reasonable credo for the moment in which we live. Thank you all very much.
for a few questions. There will be a couple of our EWMC ambassadors with roving microphones. And, you know, questions you can also, I mean, I've stirred up a lot of hornets today. I mean, abuse and things would be okay, too. Um, <laughs> I know it's hard for you here to sort of be, work yourselves up to that, but, but it'd be all right with me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I need a microphone, I'll use it anyway. I wanted to ask you about um, energy, and uh, there's a lot of emphasis today on ethanol production. A lot of conflicting information about whether you actually get more out of the corn-based ethanol than you actually use in producing it. And I'd also like to ask you about uh, what would be, other than solar, wind, geothermal, hydropower, and so on, what would be your uh, best uh, approach to making a sustainable energy future? Very good questions. Uh, at the risk of offending people here, um, I got to say, corn-based ethanol is one of the bigger bad ideas that we've had in a very long time. Um, <laughs> the energy balances aren't very good. You know, they don't, they don't, I mean, at best you get one and a half units or something of energy for every unit you put in, so you're not getting much of a bonus. Um, and, you know, I mean, the only reason anybody's doing it is because it fits nicely into our sort of federal subsidy program for growing corn, which has a lot of other drawbacks as well, including the way that it's helped to destroy family farms for, you know, four generations. Um, um, there's a bigger problem, too, with corn-based ethanol that we're beginning to, to uh, understand even in the last few months, which is that, you know, though large, our supply of corn is not infinite. And, uh, and if we begin to make any significant percentage of our gasoline using corn, it's going to come at the expense of people who actually need to eat it. The, uh, there were people rioting in Mexico City five or six weeks ago because the price of tortillas had doubled. And one of the major reasons for that, apparently, was the fact that you know, on the Chicago Board of Trade, the cost of corn was going through the roof because we were diverting so much of it to ethanol. If you think people don't like us around the world now, Wait until they begin to understand that you can feed a person for a year on the amount of corn it takes to fill the gas tank of an SUV once, okay? Um, once people around the world begin to understand that equation, then their dislike of us is going to be more less hypothetical than it is at the moment, okay? Um, um, um. As for the question of what energy source makes real sense for the future, first thing to understand there's no silver bullet, OK? Uh, we already had our magic fuel. Coal and gas and oil are incredibly cool stuff, OK? Very easy to get at. You just scrape a couple of you know, feet of soil off the ground, and you stick a pipe in the ground, and the stuff comes bubbling up, you know? Uh, incredibly dense with BTUs, um, um, you know, easy to transport, compact, everything you could want in a fuel. Um, it's true that it's destroying the earth, but other than that, um, um, it was completely great stuff. No silver bullets to replace it. At best, silver buckshot, you know? Um, and if we gather up enough of it, we may begin to get there. But the place to start isn't with any of the fuels that you named. In fact, it isn't with any fuel at all. By far the most efficient and cost-effective place to start is with conservation, okay? It is so easy to get, you, you want to find oil in this country, go drill under Detroit, okay? You raise the gas mileage even modestly, and you begin to get unbelievable savings just like that in the amount of carbon we're pouring into the atmosphere. I mean, the average car in this country today not only gets worse gas mileage than it did 25 years ago, it gets worse gas mileage than the cars that Henry Ford was pulling off his assembly line in the 1920s, okay? I mean, it is, I mean, it is crazy. I mean, literally crazy. And you, ha you sort of have to, I mean, if, when people look back on our era in 100 or 200 or 300 years, I fear the sort of SUV may be the thing that serves as the kind of emblem to explain a lot about what was going on. I mean, you know, we're all driving vehicles that were built for like forest rangers in Montana. Uh, there's no reason for us to have, uh, you know, I remember going 
years ago to the suburb where I grew up and going shopping for my mother at the supermarket. You know, every vehicle there had like, you know, like 18 inches of clearance and, you know, these, you know, big lights on top. So, you know, I mean, the only rational explanation was that there was like some raging river in the middle of this suburb that they hadn't bothered to put a bridge across and that all these people were <laughs> reaching the stop and shop, you know, in, 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 down in four-wheel drive. I mean, just craziness. Conservation of all kinds pays off very, very fast, okay? And it's easy enough to figure out how to make it happen. I mean, the kind of financing schemes, for instance, that are necessary to get good insulation in every house in Wisconsin should be easy enough to do because you know that there's going to be a guaranteed savings year after year after year. So figure out with the legislature the financing scheme that allows you to finance that, you know, the way you would anything else. Since you know you've got a payback system from the savings you're going to get, it shouldn't tax anyone's you know, uh, ingenuity too much to figure it out. So I think that's where we got to concentrate. That we, we're talking about a, uh, if we're doing this 80% by 2050 thing, right, that means a 2% reduction in carbon emissions every year pretty much through about the middle of the century. The first 10 or 15 years are almost for free just by becoming marginally efficient. And it's so much easier for us than anyone else because we're such wastrels. You know, the Europeans are busy pursuing these kind of plans about cutting 80% or whatever out of there. But they're already only using half as much as we are. They're cutting into muscle. It's getting harder there to figure out how to take the next step. For us, you know, it couldn't be easier to begin. But psychologically, it couldn't be harder because we're just so used to thinking that the only thing we need to do is figure out how to produce more of something, uh, you know. Um, someone once said, that one of the problems with economists was that they were good at adding, but they'd never learned how to subtract. And, and uh, you know, there, I'm afraid there's a little bit of that in all of us, uh, you know, at, at this point. Compact fluorescent light bulbs. Just saw an article. I, I just saw an article that the biggest single problem with adoption of compact fluorescent light bulbs are wives because they don't like the color, they don't like the time it takes for them to come on, they look funny. Um, so you're saying just sort of put them in your master bedroom <laughs> and leave <laughs> the other one. I was, I was looking for a solution. <laughs> Actually, contract fluorescent light bulbs now work fine. And they're air, with each passing generation, they become more like the regular ones. And within a two or three years, I mean, Australia just banned incandescent light bulbs. We're gonna, there was a poll, I saw the other day, a Gallup poll showing that about 70% of Americans think we should ban incandescent light bulbs already, which is a huge change. And you wouldn't have found that even six months ago. People are catching on to some of this. Um, so I think that, that one's not gonna be a big stumbling block for much longer, I hope. You mentioned that you have solar energy on your home. That, that isn't practical for all of us, but are there, is there, are there applications that, for instance, the city of Wausau should be using solar energy to um, maybe on some of our larger buildings or some way to yep. help with that kind of thing? The first thing to be said is it's more practical than you'd think. Um, the two countries in the world with the highest uh, penetration of solar photovoltaics are Japan and Germany, okay? Neither one of them very sunny. In fact, the average solar insulation in both of them less than in Wisconsin, all right? I mean, I'm at the same latitude as you up in the mountains of Vermont, and we're able to generate most of our electricity um, most of the year, and in the summer more than we, well, well more than we use, um, just because we have these solar panels. So, in fact, it's not sunlight that we're lacking, it's sort of political will to get these things done. I mean, that's what the Japanese and the Germans supplied. And what do you know, by the way, they now own the solar industry. That's where you go if you want to buy a solar panel, okay? Um, um, but yeah, there are also all kinds of things that can and should be done on a community, you know, by, by municipalities and by businesses. And really, businesses at the moment are more likely than anybody else to be doing a lot of this stuff. Conservation and 
renewables, partly because there's somebody who sits there, unlike most of our households, there's someone who sits in that business whose job it is to figure out the economics of this stuff. And they figure out very quickly that energy conservation goes straight to the bottom line, you know? So you know, like DuPont managed to cut their energy bill in about half over about five years of just dedicated application to looking at these things. Um, the most important thing, though, that municipalities can do is start changing building codes, you know. Uh, it's crazy that we build knowing what we know about the problems that we face and having access to the technologies that we do. It's crazy that we let people build crappy homes uh, everywhere. And, you know, of course developers will continue to do that until they're told not to because the developer doesn't have to pay the cost of running the house once it's up and running, you know? So they, you know, spend money putting in jacuzzis instead of putting in insulation. It would be a lot smarter to sort of tell them to do that. And this goes in a larger sense to that question about like the compact fluorescent bulbs and things. One of the big, one of the things that I found out talking to people about why they got so involved in this big campaign, this rallies we were doing this year, was because they had gone and they'd put in the compact fluorescent bulb. And even as they were putting it in, there was a kind of light bulb going on in their head saying, I, maybe this actually isn't going to stop global warming quite all by itself, you know? <laughs> the most important individual actions that we can take at the moment, I mean, there's a lot of things we can and should do in our homes. But do the math, you know? The only way we're going to do this in the time that it takes is if we work together through our democracy to make it happen on a big scale. And that doesn't take 51% of people deciding that this is something they agree on. It takes 15% of people deciding that this is something that they really care about and are going to really demand work on. And if we ever got anything like that, we'd get there. So uh, as I've started saying to people, you know, it's a good idea to screw in a new light bulb and it's an even better idea if you need to to screw in a new congressman, you know, um, or whatever <laughs> along the way. Um, um, I mean, that, I mean, although I understand your congressman's already pretty good on this stuff, yeah. but could always use some reinforcement. That's one of the things we found. It seems like you were talking about bringing basically this, this every year we look to raise the economic uh, measures of our success. And it seems like one of the things you're saying is we have to bring it down. That should be our goal, bring it down. It's going to cause a huge, it seems like there's going to be a huge um, sacrifice made by people at the lowest end of the society when this happens. And how, do you, how do you kind of help well, you, that? You have to make, I mean, that's, you know, should be, and I'm glad you raised the question. I mean, and that should be job one of any decent society is to make sure that as you do that, that's not what happens, that people who can't afford to pay the price don't pay the price. So if you have to raise the cost of gasoline to bring down consumption, you have to do it in such a way that people for whom that represents a huge percentage of their you know, weekly expenditures don't starve as a result. And it, there's plenty of ways to figure out how to do that. I mean, we were talking about Europe before, right? I mean, they have, as I said, a disposable income like half or two thirds of what we do. They also have almost invisible poverty rates two, three, four percent, okay? That's not the trade, the trade-off isn't in that way. You know, uh, 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 uh. and it's not as if the system that we've, that we've got going now is actually paying off all that well for people at the bottom end. 24, 25 percent of American kids live in poverty. I mean, that's a pretty astonishing set of figures. I mean, there's a whole bunch of figures. I mean, one of the delusions under which we labor is that we've figured out in every case how to do things best here, you know? Um, and we tend to hold that pretty strongly, but it doesn't bear up under, you know, examination very well. I mean, you know, we spend twice as much per person as the rest of the developed world on medical care. Literally twice as much. But we don't live any longer. In fact, our mortality and morbidity rates are worse than those in the rest of the developed world. Um, poverty, you know, many, many measures of things. And it's, you know, we've bought into this idea that because we've got the biggest economy that there is and the most money that there is, that therefore we win, you know? Um, but it's not as simple as that in all kinds of ways, including the one that you very properly raised. 
My question is about transportation. Mm. I think all of us who own a car know that that's not going to be sustainable in the long run and we can't keep doing it that way. And especially as what you were saying about community, uh, I wonder if you have any advice for us for communities that don't have good uh, mass tra transportation and certainly inter-community mm -hmm. transportation. We do not have uh, any yep. mass transportation in some cases. So if you have any ideas for us about how we do this from the bottom up, where yep. we can actually give up our cars. It's a very good question. And of course, it's a hard one because we've built the physical structure that makes it so hard. I mean, if you set out to design on a computer the, the system that would make it hardest to do mass transit, the American suburb is what you would come up with. You know, it's very hard. But that doesn't mean it's impossible, and it hasn't been impossible in the past. At the turn of the century, in about the 1890s or 1900, you could get on a streetcar in Boston and start traveling in that streetcar and switch to other municipal streetcar lines. And with the exception of about one 20-mile gap in western New York, you could get all the way to Milwaukee without getting off a streetcar. Okay? Um, and it's perfectly possible to imagine doing much, much more of that again. We don't live as compactly as we should, but at least we can do a lot of our trips through some way where we drive, bike, whatever, to the nearest node where we pick up the mass transit and go. And it's much more a matter of political will than anything else to make that happen. It's what we choose to spend our money on. We consider it completely obvious that we should take our transportation budget and spend 90% of it building highways and repairing them and things. And there's a huge lobby to make sure that happens. And by the way, if you happen to have a AAA card in your pocket, um, you know, to get your battery started, when jumps, you're a big part of that highway building lobby because that's what they're spending your $90 a year on, you know. Um, um, you could spend, you could reverse those numbers or even could say, we're going to spend half of our transportation money on mass transit and the half on you know, fixing what ro you know, the roads we've already got. And, and if we did that, then we would get someplace in that direction. There's no magic solution to it. Just like everything else, it's a matter of applying political pressure where it counts to make things start to change. The difficulty with mass transit is that it's such a chicken and egg problem. Until the thing is coming regularly enough to be useful to you, then it's hard to break out of the habit and take it. Okay? And so you need to get it working at a level that's good enough to, to, to justify using it. Um, but that's more than possible to do, and there are places in this country, including rural places, that have done it. Um, um, and one of the things that you described, the need for sort of inner city connections and things, is one of the easiest things to do. And in fact, with a little incentive, can be done quite easily by private enterprise, uh, I think. And there are plenty of examples to show that. This is not a question, it's a statement. Uh, the powers that be in Marathon and Portage County have decided that we need a new airport. And this would be a perfect time to demand that at least if they're going to force a new airport on it, they can make it an efficient building if you would all call your county supervisors and tell them that's what we want. An efficient building would be good. And I got to add that you know air travel is one of the things that we've really got to think about. Um, and I say this, you know, as someone who I mean I flew here to talk with you about reducing carbon. I we I said we we didn't want to do a march on Washington, you know. And the instead, you know, the result was that I've spent the last I've been in 42 cities in the last 44 days trying to get people worked up about global warming. So and it's come at a huge carbon cost, you know. Um, it's extremely difficult to imagine a future where we're using less carbon, where air travel continues to increase at the rate that it's now increasing. Um, and that kind of mobility is something that we take for granted, um, but we probably shouldn't. Um, and we should start making more and more use of the kind of tools we now have at our disposal, like the ability to communicate easily electronically. Um, um, to replace a lot of that. But yes, if you're going to build an airport, it, at the very least, it should be efficient. 
Um, and maybe you should make it so that it be con converted to a train station when the time comes. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 one more question, perhaps, and then we'll adjourn to the reception. Two more questions. Two more questions. <laughs> Um, I wonder what you think about the role of education in this economy of the future. You mentioned creativity and music, and so I guess I'm wondering what advice you'd give to young people who are choosing career paths at this point. Well, uh, I mean, in the first place, I mean, there's sort of there's sort of two different questions here. And one's about education, and one's about career paths. And since we're at a college, I would say that one of the things we need to start thinking about is whether education and preparation for a career are exactly the same thing or not. Um, you know, they certainly have something in common and you need to be prepared for careers so you can go out and earn a living and things, but the more useful value of an education is not to kind of add to your store of knowledge, it's to subtract from your store of things you think are true. Um, you know, uh, to be a little subversive about um, um, the world, you know, and to imagine different ways of living in it. So while one's at school, and, and you know, uh, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's the pleasure of the college, say. Um, um, but as for career paths and things, I mean, there are, um, what's exciting to see, I think, is the growing number of people thinking differently than perhaps their parents might even imagine they'd like them to think. Um, for instance, at Middlebury, where I teach, which is an you know, insanely expensive school, okay, we helped, I helped start, I was the faculty advisor when we founded this big and beautiful college farm garden uh, five or six years ago, okay, which is now supplying a fair amount of food to the dining hall and all of that. Um, one of the upshots of it is that in the last few years, uh, I can think of 20 students who have graduated from Middlebury, having spent you know $150,000 or something of their parents' money, who now want to go be small farmers. Um, okay. Now, some of their parents are not all that pleased with me. I got to tell you, um, um, but. It's enormously exciting for me to see that happening because they're doing it for the right reasons. They understand you know, what kind of community they want to build and live in and be a part of. And the, the, I guess what I'm saying is that the identification that we have, and it goes on in colleges and every place else too, of success with uh, uh, how much money you make um, and how high on the kind of career ladder you go and things, is probably one of those connections we do well to start breaking um, and and hold up all kinds of people as our models of what constitutes um, um, a successful graduate of this or any other institution. And we have one more, yeah? Yeah, um, I, more of a comment than a question. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who have been asking questions about uh, energy and what can we do and what works and what's appropriate. And I guess I just want to know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that know this, but there's probably a lot of people that don't know this, that Central Wisconsin is the home of the Energy Fair. Every June, east of Stevens Point, it's a three-day event. Last year, over 18,000 people came. And if you want to know about little technologies, tiny little things that you want to be, be able to do, or big stuff, it's, a, it's an amazing event, and you should just keep your eyes out for it. Um, it's the 19th year. It's the largest event of its kind in the world, and the grandmother of many across this country. Well, that's good to know, and it means that you guys have absolutely no excuse whatsoever for, <laughs> for not taking in. One more, okay. And by the way, you can find out about that at WREA.org. Um, I did have one more question, and that is, will there be a Step It Up 08? We don't know exactly what we're going to do next year uh, or in the future. I think we're unlikely that we'll just do exactly the same thing that we did before. The political landscape shifting fast, and we've got to kind of respond to that. At the moment, one of the things that we're trying hard to do is figuring out how to affect the presidential race. Um, you know, John Edwards. Uh, it was the first of the candidates to issue his energy and environmental 
position, and he said we wanted, he called us up before he did and said, you'll like this, and indeed we did, because it said we want 80% cuts in carbon emissions by 2050, and no new coal-fired power plants, which are the two things that we probably need more than anything else. Um, and now we have to figure out how to use that as a kind of wedge to get the Clinton and Obama campaigns and maybe even some of the Republicans to do something the same. Um, I don't know quite what we're going to do. It'll be, uh, hopefully it'll be creative when it happens. And we sort of, pull, because we have these tools, we're now, in the last couple of weeks, we've asked all the people who participated before on our website to send in their notions of what can be done, and we're sort of sifting through them. Um, um, one of the things that we really liked about this whole thing was the degree to which it represented a kind of open source organizing model, you know? Uh, an ability to put all kinds of minds at work figuring something out. Because as you've now had ample opportunity to observe, my mind alone is not equal to the task of you know, figuring this out. And we're much better off with all kinds of participation. And it's, I gotta tell you, it's so exciting to see it happening. It's so exciting to see it happening in all kinds of places where people have said it wouldn't happen. College campuses are coming alive to this stuff uh, in huge ways. The uh, Energy Action, the sort of student clearinghouse for climate stuff is amazing. Uh, religious communities, including evangelical communities, are stepping up to this challenge in truly dramatic ways. Um, um, uh, so are, you know, um, I mean, we had a number of good uh, uh, events that went on at senior citizen homes and retirement communities and things like that, which is really good. I mean, the, uh, you know, the baby boomers came into this whole thing pretty good, right? They did this kind of interesting job for a while and sort of stirring things up. Then they turned out to be sort of better at consumption than anything else for quite a while. But it's really nice to see sort of later acts becoming more interesting in that drama, you know? And uh, uh, I think that there's, <coughs> One of the things I really like is that so far this movement has none of the kind of antagonisms of the uh, of the 1960s. You know, it isn't about don't trust anyone over 30 or whatever. It's I mean, it's all about how can we figure out together how to do something more interesting than we're doing now. It's only begun to play out. It's going to be very exciting, and if it works, you know, if we ever got an 80 percent reduction agreement or something. One of the things that would happen is that the economic force of gravity would begin moving us in some of the directions that I've been describing towards more localized economies that made much better use of resources and made, in the end, much better use of people. You know, the question we gotta keep asking ourselves is, and it's a question that my favorite writer, Wendell Berry, asked in the title of one of his books, what are people for? We're not for making the economy larger. That's not the reason that we evolved to where we are. It's a more complicated and interesting and beautiful and mysterious picture than that. And we've kind of wandered down this one particular alley long enough. Time to turn around and, and look for some more interesting alleys to wander down. Thank you all very much. <coughs>